week at Piranha Pool. Uh, thanks to Minibar for making this happen. Uh, if it uh, if it weren't for Minibar, you guys wouldn't, uh, wouldn't all be here. So uh, just a little something about Angel Pollination. It's a quarterly networking organization of investors, not of the entrepreneurs. Every quarter we invite three companies to come and present to, uh, to the investor group. So we're always looking for new and interesting companies. So as you uh, have success in building what you're doing, please uh, track me on down along the way. We don't have a website. It's a very uh, kind of uh, uh, individualized kind of way to, uh, to get connected on in. So I uh, hope that uh, some of you can, can participate along the way. Um, so the rules of engagement for this morning are, first of all, for all you guys, this is not an offer of securities. You are here merely to witness whatever the heck is going to go on here this morning. Um, for the fish food, those are the entrepreneurs that will be presenting this morning. They have 15 minutes in total. We've got a clock down, down here at the front to time this. Um, they've all planned for a five to six minute presentation to the piranhas, and then there'll be a Q&A and negotiation. Uh, who knows uh, how that will all go, but the piranhas, um, they may decide to invest. They may decide not to invest. Uh, they may accept the terms that are being proposed by the fish food, and they may decide that they want to negotiate something different. So we don't know where, where it goes. But speaking of the piranhas, let's welcome them on down right now. Come piranhas. So we've got, uh, sorry I don't have wonderful background music and everything going. My wife, my wife wanted me to have Jaws soundtrack going, but I, I thought it was good enough I got the video moving. So yes, you get to take up a residence there. Barb Stinnett, Ron Ebensteiner, Dave Dalvey, Ed Cannon, and Joy Lindsay. And uh, the details of all their backgrounds are uh, are on the minibar site, so um, uh, they are all active uh, investors here in town uh, for, for many years, and uh, so we, uh, we're going to uh, get things rolling here with the, I said this is the best I could come up with for Piranha. Um, and uh, uh, so first up is gonna be uh, Joe Stanton from Elevate. So Joe, come on down. <laughs> Now, if I test, 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 test. There we go. You've got a microphone. All right. You got yourself push a little button there. Do I have to stand in the and pool? you have to stand in the pool. In the pool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is scary. Ready? Go for it. <laughs> All right. Hey, piranhas. I'm Joe Stanton, uh, co-founder of Elevate. It is a SaaS product that lets restaurants and retailers set up a customer feedback program, here we go, in minutes. <laughs> I am hoping to turn the slide. It should turn, oh, you push the uh, button to the right. There we go. So, yeah, if, if you do it right. So I'm here today to hopefully uh, close out our seed round that we're raising right now. So just a few weeks ago, we started uh, uh, raising, set out to raise 300K. And uh, I'm excited to announce that we recently uh, got our first commitment from Ryan Brocher at Confluence Capital of 50K. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. And, uh, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> the, uh, and uh, uh, the, the details of the investment from, from Ryan, um, it is a convertible note, uh, 1.5 million cap, 20% uh, discount, uh, 18, month maturity, 3% interest, and we can talk any more details that you'd like to know besides that. So here's the thing. Today, more than ever, restaurants and retailers want to know what their customers think. And, um, and it's really because competition is greater than it's ever been for restaurants and retailers, and yet they're competing with more and more companies and more and more are popping up. There's not more dollars to go around. You know, so they're, they're basically having to steal, steal share. And so when they want to listen to their customers, they essentially have uh, two options. So on one end here, over here, you got, they can go work with a full service customer feedback company, which is really expensive. And if you are a small, especially a smaller restaurant uh, brand or a sm or smaller retail brand, it's not affordable at all. You can't work with the full service companies. I've worked at those companies, so I know. Um, and then on the other hand, really, you have you know SurveyMonkey and all the SurveyMonkey ripoffs, right? And so the, the, the problem there is actually that um, 
while it's more affordable, uh, once you have multiple locations, it becomes very time intensive, almost a full-time job for somebody to pull the data out of SurveyMonkey, cut it and slice it the way you need it so that you can get it in the hands of your managers at the locations because that's where action happens uh, for restaurants and retailers. So because of that problem, that's why we created Elevate, which really sits in the middle. So it's the best of being really good market, product market fit for restaurant and retailers, exactly the way they need the information. And uh, it's easy and affordable. And uh, my co-founder, my technical co-founder, who's here somewhere in the crowd, um, John, is, uh, John and I have been in this industry for over 10 years. Um, and so through lots of different conversations we've had is how we identified this kind of gap and this opportunity. And so we developed the product nights and weekends over a couple of years, came to market in December, and now we're coming back into this marketplace. So, so here's a little bit um, of how it works. So my buddy Norm up there in the upper left is the chief marketing officer at Homemade Pizza Company, which is kind of like a Papa Murphy's. And uh, Norm was on one of uh, my lists, and we emailed Norm, um, you know, direct email type campaign. Norm goes to the website there. You can see the Elevate website. He checks it out. He's got 24 locations. He thinks, man, this looks awesome. I would love to get some customer feedback. I've never been able to do that before. He signs up, he creates his uh, survey, uses one of our templates, uh, he can upload his logos and his colors, and you can see he can make it branded, he gets a PC version, he gets a mobile optimized version. Down in the corner down here, you even see like he goes, you know what, I don't want to use the regular old Elevate coupon to incent my customers after the survey, I'm going to upload my own artwork. So he gets his own artwork, nice branded coupon that goes after uh, a customer gives feedback. And then, you know, he talks to his IT group, he puts the invite on the receipts, so, he, and he also creates uh, little stuffers for the, for the pizza to give his customers the opportunity to tell them how they're doing after every single transaction. So, the cool thing is that last piece, so, so Norm's aha moment came about a week into his trial. And he actually emailed me and he said, in his email said, I've never been so excited to find a problem. You know, and so, and what he found actually what, using our reports is it was really easy for him to see like, look, we got a problem with online ordering. Uh, customers who order online versus come into the restaurant are half as likely to say they're gonna come back. And so he starts kind of digging through some of the data. He actually pins down on some customer comments and even after just a week, he's already like, okay, look, the site is crashing and so they're having to bring it up a couple of times. It's really slow. And so these folks that are ordering then are having such a poor experience, they're like, look, I'm not gonna come back again. I don't wanna go in the rest, go right into the restaurant and wait, I wanna order ahead of time. And so he's able to do that with Elevate. The cool thing is there's lots of norms out there, lots of other folks like Norm. So in the US alone, there's 1.2 million restaurant and retail organizations. Um, the nice thing is is that the, uh, um, that most of them are small to medium size, almost all of them, which is like our sweet spot um, where we sit really, really well. The, uh, the other cool thing is that this is a small sliver of the entire world, um, which we actually already have two trial clients that are in Malaysia, um, and we're not even trying to go outside the United States right now. And um, there's, there's almost 40 million restaurants and retailers in the world, so pretty big opportunity. We actually have a little bit of traction here, so that little, you know, it's, it's little, yes, it's a little green uh, dot there, but we have 21 companies that are using Elevate right now. We just launched in December. So we have three paying clients, we have 18 that are in trial right now. So here's how we make money. So Godfather's Pizza um, is one of our trial customers right now. When they roll out to their 600 locations here, uh, their, their per month fee is going to be $12 per month per location. So it's a subscription-based model. So what that, the, the net on that is 7,200 MRR for, for them. And so that's how we make money. And we have both, we're just rolling out an annual pricing plan right now too. So we started with a month-to-month. -month. Is, is that an example or is that a real contract you have? So this is, this is, so Godfather's Pizza is a real Person, a real company who's using Elevate who is in our trial right now. So they're not converted to a paying customer yet. So we, we're going to have to convert them to a paying customer. So can you tell me about the trial? What, what does that mean they're in a trial? So we have, so, so when you sign up on our website right now, you get a 30-day free trial. Um, you, the 30 days does not start clicking until you actually collect your first customer survey. So we allow them the time to be able to do, you know, work with their IT and get the stuff on the receipts and things like that. So 
uh, free trials many locations as they want. You know, and so they're, so they're doing 30 locations right now. So when they roll out, they would roll out to 600, and then this would be. What would I pay with Open Table or Yelp on a monthly basis? Well, there, so those are a little bit different. Um, I don't I don't know exactly on Open Table. So Yelp Yelp, you're getting. Um, you know, it's not transaction based. You're not really getting invited based on that you have a receipt and, and a survey code or anything like that. So um, it's kind of a different animal. The, um, but like if you, if you went to, so that's 7,200. So if you went to one of the full service providers, that would probably be five or six times that a month for them to have a, a full service program. Um, and you know, and then obviously serving monkey and something like that doesn't work. Open so the open table question is interesting. So open table is gonna be a real nice, I think, integration partner for us at some point. The the thing with them is they only capture the people who made a reservation online. So anybody who didn't wouldn't get an invitation. You would need to get an invitation through another channel. So we would consider it like a channel for us to be able to get more customers into the feedback system. Seems like you're off your pitch, and I'm just going to keep firing questions. Yeah, do it. Okay. Let's go. So a couple slides ago, you you mentioned that the interaction with the the customer is a receipt, right? Do yep. you have any email campaigns, or are you strictly handing a receipt in the restaurant to a guy, and he or in a pizza box, and he has to respond to that? And if that's the case, what's your what's your penetration? One, two, three percent, or what's your what's your what's your experience with people actually doing that? Yeah. So if you do receipt based only and that's your only invitation method but if you and if you do it really well so which what, what that means is you actually hand it and you highlight it or circle and say please give us your feedback um, you'll see eight to ten percent of transactions result in a survey um, if you do a really really poor job and you don't tell anybody or anything like that you'll get you know one to three percent but I brought up this slide because this is something really exciting that we um, that we just uh, formalized this week finally is we are going to be integrating with Level Up. So Level Up does mobile payments, um, and we're going to be rolling out the integrated Elevate uh, Level Up um, program to Dunn Brothers this summer. So how much revenue do you get as a result of that? Well, for for this one, we get we signed up Dunn Brothers actually separately, and then I went and talked to Level Up and basically said. We need to integrate. So, how much is Dunn Brothers paying you? So, so Dunn Brothers would be paying us um, nineteen dollars a month per location, and so that would end up being annually nineteen six. And you have that contract already? Well, they're, so they're going into their they're going into their trial right now, so they get their thirty days, and then obviously we have to convert them. But I think our likelihood is really good since they've agreed to do the level up integration upon rollout. So. And do you know what the cost to acquire a customer is? I do. So right now, our cost to acquire, so our cost to acquire trial is $130. Our cost to acquire a customer is $900. Um, we have those 18 in trial, of which six are going to come out of trial this month. So that number is going to drastically change quickly. We expect that it's going to be probably, it's going to end up in the four to 500 range, especially when we start getting in some of these digital marketing Efforts is what we plan to spend most of the money on that we're raising, and um, that's against a customer lifetime value that's going to be, you know, at least early on, five to six k or more. Probably later on, as we kind of move up the scale and get some bigger chains in, is probably going to be ten k, twenty k. So, so the the cost of us to acquire a customer versus what that lifetime value is is actually really positive for us. So, Joe, just a quick question to follow up on that. Uh, I know that we interrupted your presentation, so That's thanks okay. for going with the flow. Um, in in one of the slides that you sent us, you talked about the paid acquisition kicking in in April. Is that just one client? Is that two? Are these the ones that you're referring to in the sample, the uh, people that you're bringing on board for revenue? Yeah. So so we have we actually have three real paying customers right now who pay us money, and then we have those 18 that are in trial. Six of them come out of trial this month. Um, and we're at, I mean, we're adding, we're adding new trials, I mean, every day right now. And to be honest, we're, the only thing we're doing right now is we had curated um, some lists and been sending kind of like personalized emails that, I mean, are mass blasted. And we have a, a sales process, an automated sales process we use that we sprint through some of these. So. We haven't even really opened, I mean, we've done a little bit of tests with Google AdWords and stuff to understand take rates and what our click-throughs are and stuff, but 
we're only scratching the surface and we're able we're we're getting more traction than we plan for even at this so point. And that's how so. you're going your that's how you're doing your client acquisition right now. Right now. Okay. Right now. That but that list so so we've we've sprinted to about 400 prospects to to drive uh, the 21 um, for the for that plus we have some other that are basically we're doing some demos with that'll convert to trial probably or two. 3 minutes left right now. Yes sir. And first of all, I want to thank you for having the guts to come in here. Um, Absolutely. I Mr. Wonderful. Stand in that pool. Um, <laughs> Watch out for the fish. Anybody who goes next. But let's get into your valuation. 3% uh, um, convertible. Any warrants that go with that or anything? Um, explain that a little bit more because that's what we care about as investors. So tell me more what you mean about any warrants on that. Is there any upside if I... Give you my, I mean, I get 3% and then you convert at the next price uh, that other people get in at? Yep, so you, you get 20% discount, which is obviously... Yeah, Joy? I like the warrants. I don't like the convertible debt. <laughs> so with, with Ryan, we agreed yeah, to the convertible, the convertible debt. Right? Well, anything's negotiable, Joy. <laughs> <laughs> our goal is to close our, our, our goal is to close our round um, so that we can really accelerate this growth. I mean, tra early traction is good. How far is so. the round going to take you? So uh, what's the milestone you're going to hit with 300,000? Yep. So, so that 300,000 um, is really kind of this nine month, uh, nine to 12 month ramp we're looking at. And so we will, we think in January, like our projections looking at that money and where we've been, that we'll be at a probably over 60 K MRR in December, moving to 80 or 90 in January. Um, w the other things it's going to be doing is, um, you know, we're going to be hiring a, a part-time onboarding uh, specialist, customer support specialist. So obviously we've got to handle this growth because there's just a couple of us right now. So, um, and then, you know, all the digital efforts. One minute. <laughs> it's, what, what's your current uh, burn rate? In the company currently today. Well, it's it's very very low. So we're part we're a part of Microsoft BizSpark and everything's in the cloud. So we actually we have no cost of goods right now. So we're bringing on all these clients, collecting data. We have zero cost of goods except sorry zero except for credit card char charges of course. So because everything's um, through credit, and then the, everything else is variable. So we're not taking any uh, salaries right now, and you know we've done very minimal kind of marketing things to test and the email list we already had. Do you expect to uh, cash flow? Do you have any projections on that? Yeah. So we, so at the uh, at the you know for this for this year we're looking to um, we'll probably be in the the uh, range of we'll make probably about forty thousand dollars when it's all said and done this year um, on about. You know, with in-year revenues of being about 280,000 or something like that that we would capture in this year. So, Jeff, do we? Well, yes. yeah. What? What? Uh, hey, crowd. The, lunch is after this. So, should we? Should we? Uh, should we cut the slack and then g give uh, give another couple of minutes here? Okay. All right. <laughs> Two, two, oh, two more minutes. Two so, more minutes. So we need to know about your technology. Who, what's the, who developed it? Do you have people? Where we we it? developed it. So so John, who's sitting, I finally found him now. He's right there. Raise your hand, John. So so John is my technical co-founder. Uh, we started the company together, um, and he has built the entire entirety of the platform. So it's all all been built by him, and then. Obviously, so I'm a, I'm a product marketing guy, so um, a lot of the design and the go-to-market strategies and, and talking with customers. And like I said, John and I have been doing this full service for a long time, both for like 10 years, John on the technical side, me on the executive side. So, um, so we know the space really well. Venture capitalists love traction. So if you started in January of 14, your website's got six clients on it. You said three, which is already outdated. You've talked about some other customers. So you're, you're obviously moving quickly with revenue paying customers. That's good. You mentioned that your trials are up around 21. Yep, at 21 as of today. Is a, has a trial ever not turned into revenue paying customer? Uh, one, ha one has not. So um, Dino's, who's a local brand, um, tried us out and then did not convert. Why? So they, well, 
So why? So she's, she said that uh, Dino's is pretty strapped, so she's the COO. And she's like, I don't have a team. I'm hiring a marketing team in July and that they would revisit at that time. Um, she had very, very positive things to say about the simplicity of the reports, the way that they were actionable. They collected, they were getting almost 100 surveys a restaurant um, in the trial. So there, there was enough data, so there wasn't any problems on that end. And they actually were all in on it. We we're kind of surprised that they didn't because they put in, they had window clings they put in, plus they were doing receipts and they had signage in the restaurants. So, Is your pitch to the restaurant ease of use in putting together these, these surveys or is it it's cheaper? It, so it's, it's three-pronged. So it's that it is way easier to use and deploy and set up on your own. It's uh, you know a third to a fifth of the cost of anything else you would do, and it's built exactly for restaurants and retailers the way you need to see the information to improve. Okay, so Joe, you're you're raising three hundred thousand. See, yes. it's a live event. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd be willing to put in fifty thousand with some additional due diligence. Okay. If, if another one of the piranhas would. Go with me on that and All right. do some due diligence as well. Cool. Okay. Piranhas. What else I, I got? I would. Yes. <laughs> I, oh, I know. I know. I know. I would, I would jump on that, and I would um, um, always like to invest with joy. Um, it, would, it would need to be an equity deal for me. It would have okay. to be a straight equity deal. Um, tw you know, you had 300 grand for 20% of the company or 25% of the company, so roughly a $1.2 million valuation. That's kind of where I would be. I would be in the $1.2 million valuation. But we would, uh, would co-invest 100 grand or so with some further due diligence. The traction's attractive to me. We've got a company in our portfolio called Ground Control. Okay. Similar strategy, not going into the retail and uh, restaurants, but um, you know, we could we could we could learn a lot from each other. So we would put 100 grand at uh, equity structure that's going to be in the 1.2 million dollar post money. Okay. Value. Yeah. Okay. Not common stock though. Well, we'll talk about it. We'll talk, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll talk about it in the due diligence so, stage. Yeah. But obviously, I'd, I'd want to talk to Ryan too about this. Due diligence long enough, which they may, because they do a very good job on that. <laughs> and it's June, and when we look to see what your numbers really are and what your forecast is, yeah. you might have another taker. Yeah. Maybe. And Joe, yeah. I, I would actually would join in with the Piranhas on, on that for the uh, for 50K, doing the due diligence as well. Awesome, Barb. Wow, this is... <laughs> All right, not so bad. Do we do this again next week? All right, I say we, I say we stop there, folks. I say we stop there. Yep, look forward to working with you. All right, it's an experiment, right? You know, nice job, Joe. The, crowd, the crowd's a rough one. Um, all right, so let me get to... See, yeah, the other slides. Uh, so now... So now, uh, now, now you know how difficult it is to stay within the, within the time frame. You wonder how they do it on TV, and it uh, uh, gets to be a little bit of a trick. So our second one up in the pool this evening, the second fish food, is Chris Carlson of 4Cubed. So, Chris, where are you? There you are. Come on down. Somebody move. Can we move those so, as a pointer... I'm just worried he's going to wipe off. Oh, that's not, that wasn't the right button. <laughs> Maybe that one. That's not the right one. Maybe one of them to drop um, over and I don't put it on a piranha. <laughs> Maybe. But that's the right Aha, uh -huh, it is. Yeah. You, can, you can see it there. See it? Yeah, how am I advancing my slide? You advance to the right, the right, right button. Okay. And uh, the, the timer is right over here. Hop in the pool, you and you're on. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Hello, piranhas. Hello. Um, Hello. Forewarned is forearmed. When I grew up, I had piranhas as pets. <laughs> So I know what it's like, and I know how you guys behave in a group environment. So <laughs> just want to just want to be transparent here. So I founded Four Cubed in 2005. We're an affiliate marketing company in the online poker space. Uh, since that time, we've referred over 1.3 million poker players to online websites, as well as over 3 million of their playing accounts. Uh, this is my team. We're currently in Northeast Minneapolis. Company we have 12 people. Here's how affiliate marketing works. Uh, essentially, what's happening is there's a digital table that, the, that these rooms down beneath are operating, and I own a portfolio of websites. All these websites have different characteristics to them that drive in traffic, whether it's casual poker players, professional poker players, um, 
intermediate gamblers, people who are interested in learning. And I also have websites that cater to internet marketers, people who are interested in making money from people who might want to go play poker or figure out how to monetize the traffic that's coming to their websites. What happens is the traffic comes into my portfolio, they click on my links, and then they go to play on the digital tables. I then have contracts with all these operators beneath, GameSys, Caesars Entertainment, BWIN Party, Tropicana, and Virgin Games, and they pay me based on how much traffic I send through and typically how much of that traffic converts and become play paying players on their websites. So the way I make money, there's two main revenue streams. It's through affiliate marketing and also through native advertising or basic banner advertising. It's taken a newer twist now in the, in the US market. Um, under affiliate marketing, we get paid a cost per action. So I usually get paid between one to $300 for each player that comes through my websites, goes onto a poker operator site, and converts into a paying player. There's a minimum set of criteria, usually between 50 to 100 hands, and then that releases the CPA for that player. So Chris, what was your revenue last year? Last year we did 2.7 million in revenues. Um, you'll see, and I, I neglected to start the beginning with this, I'm a global business. We do almost all of our revenues right now internationally. And what's exciting, what I'm pitching this money for, is the opportunity in the United States. So it's a new initiative into a new demographic region, being the United States. My cost per action model and my cost per action websites is the one that's really geared towards the casual poker player. I try to find the casual players. I give them a starting amount of capital. And I teach them how to play. And I get them comfortable playing poker. And I introduce them to the game. I then try to transfer them over to my other websites where I get paid a revenue share. I get paid a lifetime revenue share of each player that goes to that site and plays. I have, pl I have players that are playing right now. They've been playing since 2005 and still driving revenues to me. So it's a really, really wonderful annuity revenue stream for me. See, if I could, if I could um, not be rude and ask a question, because Please. your ability to run the business is unquestioned. You're worth $13 million. So the real question is, you know, how fast are other states going to come on? You've got New Jersey, New York, Delaware, you know, what's the, what's the ramp for the next couple of states? Absolutely, and that's obviously the crux of the investment is how quickly those states are going to go and something I don't have complete control over. Right now, there's two states that are really heating up, one being Pennsylvania, and we think Pennsylvania is going to be going live within this year. Uh, California just proposed two bills, which look very attractive, and New York just proposed a bill as well. Massachusetts is heating up, and so is Maryland. I'll show you projections in a few slides from now on how we're projecting that to play out over time. And I think that the market, where right now it's roughly a $300 million market with the three states that are live, I think it'll be roughly about $3 billion market within the next four to five years based on another five to seven states going live. So the, so the $2.7 in revenue came outside of the U.S.? Came, out, came outside of the U.S. U.S. revenue do you have? I have 180,000 in U.S. revenue, which is largely under this native advertising model, and it's completely driven out of the state of New Jersey. Oh, it's all advertising. Okay. It's all flat advertising. It's all steeped in the amount. They base those dollar amounts on what players actually drive through and play at their sites, but they're, playing me, they're paying me on how I manage their brand, how I'm socially mentioning them in media channels. I have a bunch of news websites, how I'm displaying their, their properties and talking about their brands. Um, you must know that in the state of New Jersey, it's a tiny market. And I did 180,000 in revenues in just the state of New Jersey in the first six months of it going live. So it went live this past November. I have contracts with, on the last slide, some major operators for 184,000 in six months. Who are the current players that are playing on your site? The current, the poker players or the operators? Well, the people who come to your site, where, where are you generating? Are these American or all foreign? They're all foreign, but in the, in the state of New Jersey, they are people that can be foreign in the state of New Jersey, anywhere in the United States, but they have to be within the geographic region and the confines of the state to be able to play online gaming in New Jersey. Isn't there a Supreme Court decision here coming up pretty soon regulating or uh, making uh, online gaming much more difficult for states such as New Jersey and, and Nevada? Well, Sheldon Adelson is trying to pass such a bill and have a reverse on the Wire Act opinion, which if we go a little further, right here you see in December 23rd, the Department of Justice issued an opinion letter on the Wire Act and said it only pertained to casino betting. I'm sorry, to sports betting. It didn't pertain to poker or uh, casinos. 
That's what signaled to all the states that they could start offering online gaming, which is where Nevada came from, which is where Delaware came from, which is where New Jersey came from. Sheldon Adelson is now trying to propose legislation that will reverse that opinion letter and ban it uh, on a federal level. It does not seem to have much traction. He obviously has a lot of money. He has a lot of political prowess, but so does George Soros, Caesars, MGM, the AGA, and everybody on the other side of the table so that's fighting against him. Taking the approach him. of not having to go the one by one, state by state. Well, he's trying to ban it altogether. Oh, banning it. Altogether. Um, I guess 2.7 million in revenue, but only 150 grand net margin. So. Where were all your expenses? Or, and are you a C Corp or an S or an LLC? We are an LLC. Okay. I own 98% of the company. I've had a little bit of financing in the past. Um, so where did all the money go to before you know, the 2.6 million to leave the 150? Because you're, you're sitting there with a valuation of $10 million right now. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, an EBITDA of 10 would get you a million five valuation. So we sure. got to see where there's an upside going forward. The upside is the United States opening up. My ability to take the finance that's being invested in the company and be able to focus on my global business, which has been neglected because I haven't had the growth capital to be able to focus on my global markets. That 2.7 has been relatively passively generated from all the work I've done in the past. In 2013, I basically stole from that side of the business and focused on the United States because that is where the, all the market opportunity is. There's going to be a $3 billion market opening up in the U.S. out of nowhere that I used to be a $13 million business based upon. So when you were a $13 million business, what was net income? My net income was around a $1 million. And so what Taking did out my expenses as owner-operator, there was another. It was so about did you reinvest 5. that money into the company? It's all been reinvested into the company. You've been profitable every year for the last nine years, right? Excuse me? You had a profit every year for the last nine years. I had a profit years. every year for the last nine years. I lost 80% of my revenues and maintained profitability through that period. So why raise money now? Why not grow organically? Because I see a very finite time period for this to take place. There's a lot of big players joining the industry right now. I've been pursued by a company in Israel who wants to buy me because of my access to the U.S. market. And I'm getting lowballed in value right now, obviously, because the market hasn't shown itself. I have an opportunity to start building traffic in all these states where traffic is very cheap to build before the states go live. What's happened in New Jersey, I was driving traffic at 65 cents a click, and now I'm getting paid $10 a click when the state has gone live. So you can see what happens once these states go, the increase in revenue as a result. Chris, I think you've done a fantastic job, especially when you had up to 13, and some of the things are out of your control of where it's at. Uh, there's a good opportunity with these start to come on. but. Based on the uh, attraction and the uh, uncertainty of that, and also not really having experience in that, for that reason, I'm out. Okay. I would also agree that your your you know your ability to manage a company that has had an 80% revenue drop is impressive. I don't know very many companies ever that have suffered an 80% revenue drop and stayed alive. So, so you know. I've always said 95% of my decision to invest is made on people and their ability to execute a strategy. So that's a very strong suit for you. It's 95% of what you've done. You've operated a business. Unfortunately, the 5% of your business has to do with the government. And I've lost a lot of money waiting for the government to make decisions from the FDA. So for that reason, I'm out. That's my problem whenever you have uh, uh, the government deciding whether or not it's just, you know, in or out, mm -hmm. I'm out. Fair enough. Are you, do you have more slides? Absolutely. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know how we're going to Why don't I show you a little here. more about the team? I oh, guess you well, understand how traffic works. It's, it's you and I, Ron. Yeah. Here's what we've done in the state of New Jersey. Let me, let me just give you an example, if, if that's OK with you. Um, so we knew the state was going to go live organically. What we were able to do is grow our traffic in that state by 1,000%, resulting in the 180,000 in contracts in the state. I used to do native advertising globally in 2012. I did 90,000 in revenue. So it just gives you an example of the revenue ramp up that will happen in the United States when this goes live. The downside protection is I have a global business that is doing 3 million in revenues very passively. So if I'm properly capitalized, I can grow and I can move into Asia, I can target South America, and I can keep expanding into Eastern Europe while I build into the United States, and that'll temper the risk. 
How many uh, how many employees do you have on board currently right now? We have 12 full-time, a handful of contractors. Uh, we have six lined up in the pipe. Marketing director coming on. And how much are you raising? Uh, 800,000. And at what valuation? At 8 million. 8 million pre-money? Correct. Um, so 800,000 for 10% of the company. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like the valuation because of the inherent risk with government action. However, um, I, I have a, uh, a sweepstakes company down in Florida that does very well, or yep. did, yep. until the government shut it down. Yep. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but we ran it for five years and made gobs of money doing it. I'd be very interested in talking to you further. I don't like the valuation, but I, I could be persuaded to do 100000 uh based on further analysis of valuation. So what, uh, what kind of valuation is, does your guts say? Well, I, I, I really have to do more due diligence and take a look at your revenue uh, stream and where it's coming from and et cetera. But uh, gaming, especially you know Las Vegas type gaming, mm -hmm. is going to be very big. Uh, despite all the government action. Every state government is looking for revenues. Yep. They want revenues as uh, as illustrated by our pull tab, electronic pull tabs here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So states are looking for revenues and they will license online gaming at some point. It's a matter of when and not if. That's right. Yep. Yeah, I'm just concerned it's not going to be in my lifetime, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. I would recommend that you go down to Canterbury because there's some guys that mm -hmm. are, play running back for the Vikings and they like to, you know, they do make a lot of money. And I would think that you might be able to pitch that. I would also go down to Vegas and rent a room on the second floor in the lobby and put up a little display and get some of the poker players to come by and go, hey, because they get it. So they Lyle Berman sits space. on the board. He's probably one of the most you got it. famed poker players out there. And uh, he's, he's just decided to join the board, and we're actually really excited about that. Is he putting money in? He will be putting money in. He right now typically... That's your audience. Yeah, he typically... Well, is this going to be... F yeah, uh, no. yeah, it's, it's going to go being out. recorded. Okay. <laughs> so while sitting on the board, we're extremely excited about Great. it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Sven's, Sven's phenomenal. Good, you Darren, good, I think Darren's yeah, here in the audience. I, uh, I, I've assembled a nice, I've yeah. assembled a nice board here to really complement each other and challenge me and my ability to steer the business. Uh, my team, myself, graduate of Lehigh, Arthur's the original technologist who who built my software stack. Uh, he left after Black Friday, went out and worked for Engine Yard, which is a cloud-based uh, company. That does a lot of uh, cloud support and hosting for Amazon. He then did his own startup, always had a phenomenal relationship with Arthur, and he sees the U.S. opportunity just like I do, so he's come back into the fold. Extremely excited about that. Jill's been with us for six years, just got her CPA. Uh, she's the yin, yin to my yang, keeps the train on the tracks while I'm trying to chase every shiny ball out there. I, I have a feeling that your current business model is not the business model you're going to end up with, but the fact is that you're in this space, and this whole industry is coming, and it's just a matter of time. Now, it may take a year, it may take five years or 10 years, but if you can maintain profitability or cash flow positive during this period of time while you're remodeling your uh, business model, you could be very successful, and yeah. you could be right in the catbird seat when this thing blows up or uh, uh, explodes. really uh, um, progresses. Mm -hmm. Is it all dealer's, I mean, can you do dealer's choice or is it all Texas Hold'em anymore? <laughs> <laughs> well, right now, at least the way the games are, the, the, uh, it's whatever the operators are providing. So there's a bunch of different games. I'd imagine as, as the games develop and enhance, dealers and whoever is going to have more authority over how the games are being played. Yeah, well, I think we all agree. You've, you're, you've got, done an amazing job. You've got, you're really an expert in this area. It's just for those of us that don't like the regulatory risk, mm -hmm. I think. But you've got a great team, and you've done a great job. So, and, and all right. So what I what I what, I what I think we got here is I think we got uh, Eben Steiner is a serious prospect here, uh, not quite closed down, but uh, uh, Chris, you'll beat up on him afterwards. <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, here the piranhas have to beat up on the fish food the the, the other way around when we get out of here. So, uh, um, and, uh, and, and and is anybody else still in? I think we all yeah, went out except for so. Ron. Ron is it. All right. So there we go. So I think I think we call it quits on that one.
Thank you, Mr. Chris. Thank nice you. job. Nice job. Thanks. All right. Thanks. See how this works? Money's easy to find. All you have to do is just show up uh, on a Saturday morning and people uh, say, sure, we'll throw money at you. That's kind of a nice thing. Um, all right, and our, uh, our, our third uh, um, serving of fish food uh, for the day uh, is Kid Stuff. Uh, well, I should, should say Kidison uh, and Doug Nichols. So, uh, Doug and Dory. Hi, Dory. Welcome aboard. Uh, you guys can share a, a, a mic while I get you by? Yeah. Okay, that's, uh, that's cool. I think you might want this. Oh, yeah, thanks. And uh, I can do the tap if you want me to at the appropriate moment, okay? Very good. Should we do this? Judges, audience, hey, my name is Doug. Hey, Doug. I'm the chief executive kid at Kidizen. All right, I'm Dory. I am the kid co-founder. Um, do any of you have kids? Any kids? Any kids? Anybody here have kids? All right, yes. All right. So if you have kids, you probably have piles of kids' clothes, toys, and other things that you need to get rid of, and you constantly need to acquire more, right? They say it takes a village to raise kids. Well, same goes with dealing with all of their stuff. Kidizen is your go-to network of parents for buying and selling pre-loved kids' stuff. Now more than ever, uh, people are turning to resale, parents especially. Nearly half the U.S. population is expected to go online this year to buy and sell pre-owned goods. That's up 13% from last year. If we take this and apply it to pre-owned kids stuff, you get a market size just in the U.S. of 19 billion. So clearly there's a really huge opportunity here. We're going to jump right into a demo. I'll just direct your attention up here and we're going to show you how Kidizen is uniquely positioned to win the market. Jump right into a demo. Jump right into a demo. <laughs> you know you can do it. Oh, I think it started. Okay, cool. So Kidizen's live right now. It's in the App Store. Uh, it's actually featured in the App Store as of yesterday. <laughs> What's cool about Kidizen is our community. So we're a community marketplace where parents connect with each other around their kids. So we have a shared passion, which is our kids. There's my kid, her name's Daisy. And what's cool about kids is we have this cool thing called a kid filter. So if you just put a little information in, age and size of your kid, I can filter all this content, see results of all the live listings, and I can see all the things that will fit my kid. It gets better. So Easter's coming up, I'm shopping for an Easter dress for Daisy. Looking at some dre dresses that are in here, I like this one, I'm gonna drill down and look at that. I can see that seller has multiple photos, very cool. I love the detail on this. I favorited that. And I'm going to add it to my cart because I see other people favorited it too. Now here's where it gets really neat. Dot's shop is the seller. I'm going to go visit Dot's shop. And when I visit Dot's shop, I can see all of the items that she has for sale. And I can get a sense of her style. I can get a sense of what she has in there. I like that one a lot. I'm going to add that to my cart too. And now if I follow Dot's shop, I can go back to my feed, that top button up there. And I can sort to my following. And now I'm following Dot Shop. I know that I like her style. And I know that she's got stuff that fits my kid. And I've got a curated list and an inbox and iOS notifications. And for Kidizen, that's incredible retailing data. We made the app really simple to, simple to use. Simple menu on the left-hand side. It's incredibly easy to sell. Uh, simply one page, a few, few details. Tap, tap, tap. And of course, simple to check out. Tap cart. Pay with PayPal and the item's on its way. Excellent, thank you, Doug. All right, so that's what we're up to. We'll take a look at the competition. Currently, uh, well, we've had eBay and Craigslist for two decades now, and what we're finding is that parents are moving away from these options, seeking a more curated and social shopping experience. A uh, number of others are going after this opportunity, including ThreadUp, by taking an old consignment store model and putting that online. They serve as middlemen, so there's no direct peer-to-peer -peer interaction. There's also a high overhead, and so they have to put a hefty markup um, on what is sold and take a big cut of uh, what people sell. So something interesting is happening right now. Thousands of parents are setting up shop on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, they're creating separate accounts just so that they can buy and sell directly with other parents, sell their kids stuff specifically with other parents. So imagine if we had this level of community, but with the actual tools needed to buy and sell. Uh, that's where you'll find Kidizen at the intersection of community, curation, and convenience. And for us, it goes a little bit deeper. It's, Kidizen is about 
connecting parents through what they love the most, their kids. Ah, okay. Cute kid <laughs> photos. We'll move on to the numbers. Hey, All right, can I, can good I, stuff. May I jump in for a second? Go oh, and back to your competition. And so, sorry if I'm rude, but I just have a question. That's cool. So, so I was um, very intrigued with this because I have I have some young kids. I actually went into your site and was a little bummed out because I could only pay with PayPal, so there would be some other payment options. But um, there's probably a dozen or 15 competitors out there from Stork Broker, ThreadUp, Swap Baby. Uh, Baby Junk, Jumblazar, Kitty O'Mall. I mean, you should know. I mean, you probably know these yeah. already. And and some of them are very highly venture funded. Highland Capital's in there. Bain is in there. You've got uh, Right Ventures in there. So it's getting to be a very crowded marketplace. So the simple question is, what are you going to do different to get mom and dad to sign up in what's going to become a very competitive market very quickly? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I wouldn't say it's becoming competitive. I'd say it is competitive. There, there are other players out there, and it's an age-old problem that, that has been around. A, first of all, there's a huge opportunity in terms of market size. The different differentiating factor for us is about community. So we look at, we look at in particular, ThreadUp you mentioned. ThreadUp is on a Series C, San Francisco funded, very big company. They have to manage all the inventory. So they're, they're an online consignment store. They've taken the brick and mortar, and their disruption model was to have people send it in. So users send in clothing, and then they inventory it, they photograph it, and post it. Um, users don't directly connect with each other, and they don't have any data around predicting what users are going to want next. What we have is we understand that our mom, we know exactly how old our kids are, we know what she bought, we know who she's following, and when somebody posts a new item, we can directly target that mom. One, one follow-up question, not to beat you guys up, but one follow-up question is Swap, swap Mamas and, and 365, Mom365 does the same thing. Oftentimes, they'll give away for free. They'll give you a bag of goods. If you give them a bag of goods, you know what they're selling. So how do you compete? I know you're, you're at a 7%, 70% you know, for, for your, your revenue model. But how do you compete with people that are giving clothes away for free? So the swapping model is actually an, an interesting one. Uh, ThreadUp tried that before they moved to the consignment model. And swapping requires that um, you have equal numbers of people getting rid of stuff and getting stuff. And so you, to participate, you have to get rid of stuff and get stuff. You can't just be a buyer. Whereas in our model, we only need about 15 to 20% to actually be sellers, and the rest can be buyers. Uh, so that balance really is hard to achieve, and that's what um, ThreadUp found. Uh, swapping also inherently has a lower quality uh, of goods because people don't want to give their good stuff away for free. And oftentimes our users will actually, they'll send some of their stuff to ThreadUp, but the good stuff, the stuff that they want to get a, good, a high return on, they'll sell on Kitizen because so, that's where they'll, they'll get the most for their money. So are you going to talk about your traction and what revenue? So we launched, we spent about a year in private beta. In December, we launched our full app. Uh, ever since launch, we've been at about 80% month over month growth on, on user side, well over 100% growth on revenue side. We're currently um, seeing a really nice buyer acquisition cost. It's buyer acquisition cost, not customer acquisition cost. Customer acquisition cost is below 30 cents. And we see that we get repeat buyers. 31% of our users are repeat buyers. That's a phenomenal number in e-commerce. So it's, it's inexpensive to acquire them. Sorry, I bumped this. And, uh, and, and we get payback fast. What percentage do you get of the $18.50 dress? Awesome question. <laughs> so we have two revenue models that we're focusing on right now. The first one is a small commission for any seller who is um, shipping the item on their own. So there, there's millions of these sellers out there. They're on eBay, and they're coming up on Facebook and Instagram, and that's where we've been pulling them over from. Introducing a convenience um, factor this summer, it's one of the things that we're raising money to do. So in this model, uh, Kitizen will pay for the shipping and will reduce the friction point of a seller who isn't comfortable with uh, shipping something. How much do you make on an $18.50 dress? 7%. That's it? Yep. But But yeah. you never see the item. You're saying that in that case, it's, it's consumer to? It's, it's peer to peer. And the 17, do you see the dress in that model? Nope. Or you're just shipping, you're just providing? We provide them a, a shipping label. The basket size goes up because we're doing a collection of items. So our basket size gets up to about $50, $60 on the low side, about $100 for a collection on the high side. And we get about 17% of that. 
um, we're paying for the ship, and so actually, as that basket size goes up, we make more and more revenue. So, what's your rev what was your revenue last year? Zero. We right. were a private beta. Well, and what's your projection this year? Our projection this year is in a year from now, when we're raising our Series A, we'll be at a half million annual. So, well, how much are you going to need in the Series A? About 1.7. 1.7 to 2.5, it's hard to say at this point. And how much are you raising now? 500,000. Oh, sorry. It's great. Uh, as founders, we've all got money in the business. None of us have taken a draw. We've raised capital from external angel investors in the Valley and locally. We're currently raising 500. We've got 450 verbally committed. We're looking for another 50. We are in diligence with nine investors, and we have a number that um, we feel good about all of them, let's just say that. And you asked about the goal, so goal is Series A. Tech, technology, are you MVP stage now, or are you full commercial? MVP, or? Do you have, do you have, a, do you have, a, do you have a fully viable product? Yeah, we do. We, so you're commer commercially ready. How many, how many apps do you have downloaded? 600. <laughs> no, downloads, um, well, it's hard to say because we just got featured in the App Store. So it's going to be a lot more today than it was yesterday, but we're over the 7,000 mark in downloads. And what about Imagine. iOS? Do you have? We're on I. We're, yeah, it's an iOS iPhone app. We're a mobile-first company. It's it is a mobile app. Um, you can make purchases but it, online. But that's the only. Do you have dro the Droid versions? Available? Androids. Androids later. Um, right now, our focus is iOS and really fine-tuning all the features and then porting over to Android. Are you, an, are you an Android user? Yeah, I am. <laughs> Joy's out. But She's my out. Kids, my, kids, my kids are 27 and 29. I don't think they want to swap their clothes. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm sorry. When's, when's the Android version coming out? Uh, our, our plan right now will be for later on in the fall, uh, around September, October time frame. You said of the, of you're focusing on the A of the capital that's been raised. It is all angel. Is that correct? Currently? Yes. Uh, our previous investors were angel. Okay. This round is VC firms and angels in the Bay Area, Chicago, the East Coast, and a couple here. Okay. In a $500,000 round? Mm-hmm. And what's the valuation? Oh, we're doing a convertible note. You uh, love those you, yeah, you love these. It's a convertible note, 20% discount, 5% uh, interest, which rolls in, and a $5 million cap. And what if, what if you don't convert? What, Not going to happen. Bridge to nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, if we don't convert. Suppose you got an acquisition offer before then. Yeah, those, those uh, notes convert uh, in, the, in the acquisition offer, and you do very well. If they don't convert Joy, then you own a lot of baby clothes. That's, That's right. <laughs> Should we talk about acquisition a little bit? It's way too early for us to talk about acquisition, yeah, but you're probably <laughs> thinking about what, what exit talk strategy. About the exit, yeah. 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 So we're not building a lifestyle business. We're, we're doing this to get a return on investment, and we're doing this here in Minneapolis because we want to be part of building something awesome in Minneapolis. Um, yeah. And it's consumer. And we know that, that consumer is tough to do in Minneapolis, and we feel like we've made great traction so far. So exit, three different categories of, of acquirers. One is probably the obvious one people think of. Uh, there are uh, other marketplaces out there. Think Amazon, think eBay. Uh, we have a very different verticalized model, and it would be a, essentially a competitive threat. It would be a competitive threat, and they would acquire us because of that competitive threat. Um, second category would be Retailers of kid stuff, Babies R Us, Toys R Us, Zulily is a really interesting one. Zulily has a flash, uh, flash sales, they have a really tough return policy, policy. We have an amazing return policy. It was a joke. Um, <laughs> so that's the second category. Uh, the, third, the third category, um, which may not be quite as intuitive until you think about it for a second, which is online media companies, or media companies in general. Media companies want eyeballs. The eyeballs we have is mom. Mom is the key purchase decision maker in the house, and we have incredible data around what she's purchasing when and why. So a media company wants those eyeballs on their site, and they want to retain those eyeballs. So that would be another category. But you only have 1,600 Facebook friends, I believe. Now, are, are you going to try to drive that up to 10,000 and, and, or get them into 
the other social media areas? We actually, we have 1,975 over thereabouts, <laughs> just to correct you. The, the apple must be behind uh, it. Yeah. Um, so actually, um, the, the, the social play is, is very key for us. Uh, Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, we are working with key influencers. Um, primarily, actually, in, on Instagram, though, more th so than Facebook um, and on Pinterest. Uh, so, and our blog network is really key for us in terms of our ma marketing strategy and having ambassadors who uh, are kind of celebrity bloggers who are going to set up shop on Kitizen and talk about that. They'll buy stuff on Kitizen, talk about that. Um, so that's definitely um, part of the mix. So, so getting back to the ra the raise, you're you've ra you're raising five hundred thousand. You've got commitment for. We're in verbal discussions with about four fifty, of that. Oh, verbal discussions. So no commitments yet. Oh. I'll consider a commitment on our, on the round when we've got the money in the bank. Um, we've right. got, we've had Sign verbal documents. conversations. Yep, yep. So and we're lining up for that for over, in the course of the next two weeks. Oh, what's the minimum investment? Fifty. I would tell you, I would put 50 in, pending due diligence, just because I saw you pitch at Angel Pollination, pitch for Jeff, and I thought you did a great job, and I like your style, and I got to give you credit for coming in here to a bunch of piranhas like us. <laughs> so, pending serious due diligence and the fact that I think you can get on Android a lot easier than that, it's not that tough. Yeah, yeah and I, 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 I don't like they the B2C space. I love the fact you have women co-founders. Co that that's awesome. Yeah. And, there. Yay. <laughs> um, I'm not sure 50. I'm a little nervous about this crowded space. We can negotiate. Okay, we'll talk. <laughs> we'll um, do a joint. Joy will do the due diligence, and I'll do the. <laughs> the initial the initial traction for me was I looked at your video. And, and then I got about halfway through the video and I'm like, well, they're not selling me anything. And I was like waiting for your video to really sell me something. But then by the end of the video, I appreciated what you were doing. I went back and I watched it again and it really sort of turned a little kid's jacket into sort of more of a commodity. You know, you buy Bobby a jacket and that becomes a jacket forever and it sits in a bag in the garage for a long time. But no, you actually created, in my mind anyway, a new marketplace for these goods. These goods were, were going to be worn for 18 months and then they split up, right? You know, this kid wore this for one season and then it went away. So, so I was very, very intrigued with that um, to the point that when I went in and looked online, there's just a whole host of people coming this direction with very well-funded strategies. So um, I think I'm out, but I would be willing to, and it sounds like your deal's already done, but I would be willing to have another conversation with you because it's an intriguing idea and if you and if you've, if you've got a way of distinct of distinction, of, of, you know, barrier to entry where you're going to capture market share in this, in this marketplace, then, then I'd be interested to stay in touch with you. But for now, I'm out. Series A. I, I liked your presentation. You got a great style. And, uh, but I don't know this space at all. And I don't understand it, so I'm going to pass. Thank you, and I'm, I've got my mic, so. And again, I think it's pretty exciting. Today's point is very crowded, but if it was something you were uh, willing to consider something less than 50, I'd be uh, where Joy is and want to take a look further. Awesome. All right, so I think, uh, I think we got something happening there as well, too. All right, let's, big round for all of our, Hello. for our fish food, for our, oops, for, for our piranhas and, uh, Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day at Minibar. Good luck.